Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at the electrical system that we put together in our overland truck camper build that we are renovating right now. We are halfway through the renovation, but the very first thing that we did was built out an electrical system to run all the power while we were out in the middle of nowhere. It includes a lithium batteries, solar, and inverter, and we've actually been using this system to power all of our tools and do the renovation. Now, this is the fourth time that we've done an off-grid power system on our own RVs, and each one has had a unique use case for that particular RV, and this one is no different. Yes, once again, we're using lithium batteries, but in a new form factor. So let's take a look. This is a year 2000 3000 series Bigfoot truck camper that we have paired with a Ram 5500 truck. Now we've done video walkthroughs of both of these and we're gonna put links in the description below, but we've been working on renovating this entire system and building out the truck. So today we're gonna to be taking a look specifically at the electrical system that we installed. We're gonna start here outside on the back right corner of the vehicle where the original lead acid batteries used to be installed in this compartment. There used to be a sealed fiberglass unit that sat inside here and it had just two lead acid batteries in it. But that's clearly all been removed and we installed a significantly larger lithium ion battery bank. As you can see, these wouldn't fit in through here. We actually removed the entire fiberglass enclosure and put them in from the inside. And we'll go in and take a look at the actual power system from the inside in a little bit. What we got going on out here, however, is access to our main disconnect switch, which is on the negative line of the batteries. The power runs from the batteries over this direction and then to the inverter on the inside. This is just to access that, and we've used this as a significant power run all the way around them. Out here, we also have our generator. This unit has a built-in 2,500 watt generator that it originally came with. We still need to do a little bit of work in this compartment and clean up the electrical, but this generator is going to be what we use to recharge the system when the solar is not adequate enough. We also, however, added charging from the alternator of the truck. We're gonna talk about all those once we go inside. Now what's kind of unique about this generator and how it hooks into our power system is that we're not actually using a transfer switch to connect power to this when it's running, but instead there is a plug installed in the compartment where we store the shore power cord for this RV. This is how this RV was originally built and it seems like kind of a good design. Basically, anytime we're not plugged into shore power, we take the end of the plug and we plug it in to the plug inside the RV so that the generator basically powers the RV directly. It's a really simple solution. Anytime we unplug from shore, we plug it into the generator. And whenever the generator's running, the inverter will see the generator and transfer to that instead of inverting. Now this generator is a propane generator, hence the LP designation here. We found that the propane generator is pretty great because there's no carburetor to get gummed up with gasoline or anything like that. This is a 20 year old generator and it fires up and runs perfectly. We have two onboard 20 pound cylinders and we'll probably carry a spare as well. But we're hoping that the generator is not gonna be our primary power generation source, but primarily the solar and the alternator charging off the truck. It will be backup power or when we need to run a heavier load for an extended period of time. Now, originally this compartment was a sealed fiberglass weatherproof unit with the lead acid batteries in it. The lead acid batteries had to be vented to the outside. This was just a great because they can off gas when charging or discharging. They can off gas toxic and or explosive fumes that need to be sealed to the outside so they don't get into your living space. When we removed that to gain storage and install space inside, the batteries are now actually located in the living space. However, 
Lithium batteries don't off gas at all, so they can be installed in the living space. And by doing this, we're also keeping them warmer. So we added fiberglass to the outside of this to seal it up, and then we insulated the door to help keep everything a little bit warmer if we end up in freezing temperatures. Let's go ahead and head on inside, however, and take a look at the rest of the build. All right, so coming inside the RV, Everything in the electrical system is pretty much installed down here at the very back corner of the RV underneath where the sink is going to be installed. We removed the original sink because we're upgrading pretty much everything in this RV and we installed all the electronics underneath here. That may seem a little bit crazy because yes, there is a potential leak hazard underneath the sink, but we're gonna be doing some uh, water mitigation, I guess, if you will, adding some kind of plastic and making sure that the water is not gonna get primarily on the electronics. The batteries are pretty well sealed, but even then we really don't wanna get water on it. Truthfully, we don't want any leak in the RV, but there's always a potential underneath the sink. Regardless, this was the best spot that we had to install everything, and we're gonna start out with the batteries themselves. Down here in the middle of everything are the two GC3 Battleborn batteries. The GC3 stands for Game Changer 3, and they are 270 amp hours a piece for a total of 540 installed amp hour capacity in this RV. What's awesome about the GC3s, and we've never used them before, is that they are much larger batteries with a continuous 300 amp capacity. This means that you can use lots fewer batteries and really simplify the wiring. You can also get more capacity in a smaller space. You really only need one of the GC3s to run a 3000 volt amp Victron inverter, which is what we're using in here, but we went with two to have that additional capacity. We're pretty heavy power users and the batteries really are the backbone of the system. If you wanna go a couple days without solar or running the generator, having that extra battery capacity helps us out. The primary reason that we're continuing to stick with Battleborn batteries is that they have done exactly what they say. They've been highly reliable. In our primary RV, we have cycled our batteries well over 500 times and seen very little, really no measurable degradation in the battery's capacity. So because of that, we've never had a BMS issue. We've taken those batteries all the way to the Arctic Ocean in past trips. We wanted to stick with something that we knew was gonna be reliable so that when we're in the middle of nowhere, we know that our power system is gonna to continue to work. Now everything is installed in a pretty tight spot down here. As we talked about earlier, we removed the fiberglass enclosure for the lead acid batteries. And we kind of restructured a lot of this, added new wood in here, made it stiffer and stronger. It sits on top of the generator box outside. And what's neat about these GC3 batteries is they actually have screw holes and kind of like mounting points on them. So we were able to install them and screw them down. So they really aren't going anywhere. Now in any install that's tight in an RV or an overland vehicle, you're gonna have to really think about the order of operations of how things get installed. And the very first thing that we started with was the batteries. We started with the batteries, wired them up, kind of slid them into place, screwed them down, and then brought the wires up to the next primary piece of electronics in this setup, which was the Victron Lynx shunt and Lynx distribution bar. They're installed here underneath the countertop, and what they are is the shunt, which measures all of the power in and out of the batteries and gives us a very, very accurate state of charge, and they are the distribution system, which means all the power from the batteries go into them and distribute out the wires to all the rest of the uh, loads and charging for the system. This is the first time that I've used the Link system and it's been awesome. It's really simplified wiring and it looks super, super nice. In the past, I usually use Blue C bus bars, which are basically just solid pieces of metal that you connect all the wires to, and that works really well. I always recommend using bus bars in a battery system because you're able to basically extend the battery's lugs, if you will, out to a different location, and you can land all your stuff on those. It's a much cleaner way to do a build, but the Link system was even cleaner and it gives us additional information. It actually can notify us if a fuse blows in the system and which one it is. All the power flows through the Lynx shunt 
into the Lynx distribution system. Then we connected the first large piece of electronics, which is the Victron 3000 volt amp inverter that we installed underneath here as well. The inverter is a critical piece because it's what both charges the batteries from shore power or when the generator is running, it's an inverter charger, and it also inverts battery power to 120 volt AC power, allowing us to run our outlets and everything else in the RV like you would be in a home. We can charge our computers off of it. This is how we've been running all of our power tools, running our shop vacs, and actually doing the renovation of this RV. The inverter is the biggest power use on this system and all the wiring is either 4 aught or 1 aught depending on how tight the bends were and how I was able to connect everything. In the case where we needed to use 1 aught cable, we had to double it up or parallel the cables. So the inverter is actually connected with parallel 1 aught cables on both sides. And that's the biggest cabling that you see in here from the batteries to the shunt to the inverter. The rest of the electronics that you see underneath the sink here are the three charge controllers that go to the solar panels on the roof of this RV. Now we only have three solar panels and each solar panel has its own charge controller down here. These are very small charge controllers. They're only 10 amp solar charge controllers a piece. But when you use an individual solar charge controller for an individual panel, you create the most optimal environment for that individual panel because if it's shaded, it's not going to impact the other panels at all. Now we have 495 watts of solar on the roof. We went ahead and used the same Battleborn flexible solar panels that we've used on our fifth wheel. Again, because they don't have any holes that you have to put in the roof, they are extremely lightweight and they are about the most rugged flexible or semi-flexible solar panel that you can possibly get. We've been very, very impressed with the performance on our fifth wheel. And yet again, they have provided all the power needs for the renovation in this camper so far, which has been awesome. Now, each one of these is a Victron MPPT charge controller, and they need to be fused individually to the batteries. It's always potential for a piece of electronics to go haywire at some point and to protect the rest of the system and prevent a fire hazard. They always need to be fused. So we have a set of fuses before they even reach the Lynx distribution system. Now off the Lynx distribution system, we also have the DC to DC charger that sits between this and the truck. That's installed in another compartment a little further forward. Uh, those all need to be installed vertically for heat dissipation. So it's installed in another accessible location and then the DC wires run out and connect into a plug that connects to the truck. Now on the truck side, there is a fuse at the battery system. Now what that DC to DC converter does is it basically separates the truck from the batteries and it modulates the power so that it can create the appropriate voltage to charge the batteries regardless of what the truck's power system is doing. This is a challenge that we significantly had with one of our previous builds. We talk about that in the no generator alternator charging video that we did when we came back from Alaska. We installed very large cables to get a really good charge off the alternator, but it turned out that we got too good of a charge and there was a risk of actually melting the alternator down. The DC to DC charge controller, it basically does exactly what it says. It controls the charge so that we can modulate the exact amount of charge we want off the truck and not overheat the alternator. We're gonna be pulling 30 amps continuous off the truck, which is well within its additional capacity on the alternator. We have 30 amps of solar charge controller capability and 30 amps off the truck. So we have a theoretical 60 amps of DC charging capacity via those two charging means. Lastly, the charging could come from the shore, which runs through the inverter, or it could come from the generator, also running through the inverter. So those are our primary means to charge the batteries. Off the distribution side, we also connect to the rest of the camper's DC power electronics. We basically just tapped it into the existing DC circuit board. So all the lights, all the fans, everything else that existed in the RV is run just like normal. 
The inverter we also connected in line from the shore power system. So the shore power all flows through the inverter then back into the distribution side for the AC power in the coach. That means that the inverter can power everything. It's not powering just a single outlet or two, it's powering everything. We can run the microwave, we can run all of the outlets, we can run the out exterior outlets all off the inverter. And when we're connected to shore power running the generator, it passes all that power through, so it's not using any battery power at all. Now the last piece of electronics installed underneath here in the very back corner is the Serbo GX. And this is a really neat device that I haven't used before, but I'm loving it so far. It is the brains of the operation. It's the computer that all the solar charge controllers, the shunt, and the inverter all plug into to give us state of charge of the batteries, how the power is flowing, and it reads out to this nice little screen that we installed out here. It's a touch screen, you touch it, and it gives us all the information of battery state of charge, how much power is coming from the grid, how much we're using, how much we're getting off our solar. This is an awesome system and it has the capability to be connected remotely via the internet so that we can monitor this system from anywhere in the world. This screen is an optional add-on. You can also get all this data using your phone. It has a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth functionality that I can actually pull it up on my phone, click on it, and get the data wirelessly from anywhere close to the camper. Now there's one more thing that's connected off of that distribution system and that is our new DC air conditioner. Yes, that's right, 12 volt DC air conditioner. We're trying out the new RTX 2000 12 volt version from Dometic and so far this thing has been insane. It's not running currently, but we have been able to keep this thing nice and air conditioned. Yes, off really about 300 watts of solar it's been able to keep this space really nice and comfortable running directly off the batteries now you may think uh, you could do the same type of thing with like a mini split or something but that requires the inverter to be running this doesn't require the inverter to be running and i have noticed that it really really helps in its power consumption it's already very very efficient it has a variable compressor that ramps up and down it kind of sounds a little bit like a jet engine sometimes just kind of spooling up or turning down but that helps make it very very efficient we frequently see this thing run about 300 watts i think it can boost to about 600 watts but even at that, you get nice cold air. We've been able to do the renovation in here. Air conditioned off of our solar power, which has been absolutely phenomenal. Caitlin's insisting from behind the camera that I mention that this is how we installed it originally. It's still exposed. As I said, halfway through renovation, we are gonna be building some sort of a custom shroud around this to clean it up. This is not really a drop-in solution. It doesn't fit quite exactly in the space. This was a vent, and we had to cut the ceiling a little bit larger to get this in and uh, install these metal bars, not quite like they're originally supposed to be, but we were able to make it work, and the install actually, I think, is really clean, and it's been working out really well. We had to actually seal it on the roof with a special thick rubber gasket and bring the wires out on the roof. We didn't run the wires into the ceiling. They're not run inside at all. They're run on the roof. And then they follow the wires down through the fridge vent along with all our solar wires down and to the batteries. Now being a 12 volt air conditioner, it does have pretty big cables. I think there are six gauge cables that ran the whole way. So it was a little more challenging to run those cables. But if you think it through, even that is doable. Totally worth it to have the DC powered air conditioning. So there you go, the power system in our Overland truck camper. So far, it's been doing everything that we need. It's been running all of our power tools, keeping us cool. We've been really, really happy with the performance. I think it's gonna perform really, really well once we get out on the road. As always, you can learn a lot more over on our website at mortonsonthemove.com. I will include a blog post along with this video in the description below that will link to a schematic that uh, shows how we put everything together along with more information about each of these individual components and why we selected them. Please consider subscribing to our newsletter over on our website as well. We share daily content about RVs, solar power systems, overlanding, 
pretty much anything that has to do with vehicular travel as well. Thank you so much for joining us here on Morton's on the Move, and we'll see you all next time.